golden age of comedy, 80s golden age of comedy. And many times I have people on this show that go beyond the 80s golden age of comedy. They're not necessarily comedians, but the body of work that they contributed definitely had a tremendous impact on humor, on comedy, uh, whether it be in movies or television. By the way, I'm the host. My name is Bruce Starr. And this is, you know, I'm very excited about this show because uh, one thing that the my guest does not know is I'm born April 12th. He's born April 11th. So I like you already. <laughs> <laughs> so let me bring on Peter Riegert. Welcome to the show, Peter. It's it's an honor and it's it's great to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be invited. And I thought 80s golden age meant you had to be 80. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting close. I, I, I make uh, exceptions and rules for people and... Uh, when people learn about you and your career, they'll go, oh, yeah, the things were going on in the 80s because of this gentleman that we have on. The other thing of interest to me is that we both grew up in Westchester, or at least you spent a bunch of years in Westchester. I grew up in uh, Yonkers, went to Roseville High School, and you grew up in Ardsley. Yeah, I went to Ardsley High School. We moved from the Bronx in 1954. Me too. So yeah, from I, I was there from like seven, seven and a half until maybe 17 and a half when I graduated high school. Wow. So we really, in a funny way, we have uh, some different things in common. One of my favorite movies, and it's, it's not on top of the list of a lot of people, but one of the movies that I watched when I was younger was a movie that you were in called Crossing Delancey. Uh, yes, I was a Jewish icon. <laughs> I was a pickle man. So, I mean, before we go into that, though, I want to know a little bit about your younger days. I did, I did want to bring that up first. But sure. about your younger days, tell me about when you were a teenager, even younger, did you have any thoughts about being in the business? Did your parents, you, the way you were brought up, uh, whatever, have anything to do with you getting into the business? I'm sure it did. My mother uh, had studied to be a concert pianist when she was younger, but she suffered from uh, terrible stage fright. So that kept her from going forward. Uh, and we lived in the Bronx and, you know, my dad was in the poultry business. So I'm sure there's some connection between chickens and show business. <laughs> Um, but they were, you know, I was going to the circus and rodeos since I was five, maybe. And, uh, I think we got a television when maybe 53 or two. So when I was about five and, uh, but I don't, you know, it was just part of living in New York and, and they were always taking me to the theater and, uh, movies. My dad, uh, would take me to see Charlie Chaplin film festivals. And uh, the theater was a big deal in those days, uh, especially if it were a musical, uh, you'd get the album before you went to the play. So my mom would explain to me musically what I'd be seeing. It was really fascinating experience to have that knowledge and then the excitement of going to see the play. Um, but uh, I did a play, a couple of plays in high school. I did a play in college, but uh, I, I have no recollection of ever thinking I should do this, but I was a dreamer. I was lived in my head and, and like most kids do. Um, I learned later on, in, uh, I guess in my twenties or thirties that my father's father was a song and dance man for a period of time at the Hippodrome in New York City. Wow. It used to be on 6th Avenue and 44th Street. But I didn't even know that that gene existed. Uh, my father was very funny. 
my mom was pretty funny, but my, my dad was very funny. And the two of them gave me a pretty good sense of humor. And they taught me how to look at things with a cocked eye, if that's a proper expression, uh, whether it was history or whether it was something I was learning at school. And uh, I think that's where I picked up uh, a sensibility of, of uh, myself. But I hadn't thought about it really, to be honest with you. I, I kind of had an epiphany on January 1st, 1971. I woke up to the idea that I was going to be an actor and it was as clear as clear could be. I mean, I wasn't hearing voices. I literally said out loud at 10 o'clock in the morning after New Year's Eve, uh, I'm going to be an actor. And I started calling friends who I knew were actors. And that's how I began. I was 23, which is relatively late in terms of how early a lot of people start. But, um, you know, I had, when I did that play in high school, I was very complimented for it. Uh, I'm sure somebody said you should be an actor, but just as a compliment. Um, but it wasn't until that January 1st where an idea that was probably drifting in and out of my head became a force to be reckoned with. I, I, I was driven beyond the logic of how rare it is to succeed. So I set off on that journey and I'm, you know, this is my 51st year and it's amazing to me. Wow, did, did the parents say, whoa, maybe you should look into being a lawyer or a doctor? How was their support? Their support was great. Their philosophy essentially was, if you find something you love to do, then you're a rich person. Lucky you. And uh, lucky me, absolutely. They actually had to, you know, you know, listen to relatives and friends who would say, you know, it's a phase he's going through and he'll grow out of it and blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, I, this isn't a pipe dream. He has talent and it's just a matter of hard work and luck. But they were, you know, they would come to everything I went to. And, and obviously in the beginning, it was off, off Broadway and then off Broadway. Uh, um, my first equity job, which, you know, was a union salary job. I played Chico in the musical Minnie's Boys about the Marx Brothers. Wow. And we did it for two weeks at the Philadelphia Playhouse in the park, 1,600 people. And my parents came and a lot of friends came from an improvisational company I was a part of called War Babies that I had helped start in 1972. And my folks were very supportive, uh, you know. Uh, I don't know if you remember Off Off Broadway Theater, but most of it's pretty terrible. Yeah. I mean, like anything else, most most things are mediocre at best. So, and of course, my mother always used to say, you know, she'd pull me aside, and uh, she'd say, um, "You were the best." And I go, "Mom, you know, there's a lot of talented people there." She said, "I didn't say they weren't talented. I'm just saying you you were the best." So I had her support, my father's support, and, and uh, you know, as long as somebody's behind you, you have a shot. Yeah, it's such a huge advantage yeah. to not have these voices in your head uh, trying to cut you off at the knees. Uh, you know, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. So I think it's great that you didn't have that disadvantage. Well, they actually, without them knowing it, were teaching me that challenging the status quo, they didn't put it in those terms, but that more often than not, you're gonna have to learn how to say, I disagree or I'm uncomfortable or no. Uh, my dad, we were driving down the West Side Highway going to his work, which was in the Meat District in the, in, in, on Washington Street near Horatio, which is now like one of the, you know, it's, it's one of the upscale parts of, of New York City. But back then it was just, you know, meats and chickens and pastrami and everything hanging off of hooks. And uh, he said to me, um, one of the greatest things you can learn how to say is I don't know. Of course, it took me 10 years to figure out what the hell he was talking about. But basically, <laughs> that's, I, I didn't realize I was learning 
how to deal with show business because everybody, and I'm sure it's true in every, in, in every discipline, everybody begins by telling you, no, you can't do it that way. No, that's not the right way. No, it's not going to happen for you. No, what do you think you are? You know, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think that, that I'm unique. I mean, that's just the nature of, sure. of the way the life works. Absolutely. So yeah. what was the first time where your parents and your friends got to say, oh, just let me give you a little side step. For the comedians, it was being on Carson or right. getting on Letterman. Well, was there a point where they said, oh, my God, he's he's really serious. He's 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 made it. Well, uh, they never said he's made it. Because in the beginning, really seriously, the first year was mostly off off Broadway plays. And then I was invited to this workshop, this improvisational workshop, which became a company called War Babies. And that's how I learned how to act really, because uh, learning how to listen, which is 90% of improvising is a big deal, but I didn't go to drama school. So I was apprenticing myself to everybody around me. So uh, I would pick up things along the way when pe I would hear people say, it's not one break, it's 50 breaks and it's endless breaks. And you need, you need a break all the time. It wasn't one movie or it, I'll give you a, the best example was in that first year, uh, I'd maybe done a play or two and really quickly within six weeks, I got a job off off Broadway. So that was fast. And uh, this fellow was maybe three years older than me. Uh, we went out for drinks and I said to him, how do you know you're getting better? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm kind of doing this a year. I think I have talent, but is there any indicator that I'm getting better? And he said, look around you at the people you're acting with. If they're getting better, you must be getting better. Wow. Because it's a, it's, it, it is a competitive, challenging business. Nobody is going to hire everybody else who's good and say, well, let's give that untalented schmuck Rieger a job. It's everybody is in it together. And that was one of the first indicators was when I was realizing that the people around me were getting better. And then it was just a question of luck. Wow, that's a, that's a beautiful insight. I love that. I never yeah, heard that yeah. before. Yeah, yeah, so, it helped me a lot in the uh, in almost everything I've done. Uh, I would say, try to find people who know more than you, and you can't go wrong. Absolutely. So, how does someone uh, off Broadway? How do you? break that glass how do you how did that happen for you where you started making some uh getting paid progress well getting paid progress wasn't until 1973 i made a little money with the improvisational comedy but i mean this this was so few dollars it put the idle in little i mean okay. there was not a lot of money right so the first paying job i got was this Minnie's Boys job where I played Chico. And it was the Philadelphia Playhouse in the park. It was two weeks and I think I got $325 a week, which scared the hell out of me because I, I knew what nothing was in terms of not being paid. In my demented mind, I was thinking, well, what's $325 worth of acting? And will the audience know? I mean, I was really naive. Because I thought they, you know, people would go, well, he's a two hundred dollar actor, not a three hundred five dollar <laughs> actor. But I would say the improv group became, I'd say, one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, who by was 19, in it? who was in it? Uh, I don't, you know, people who had some careers that that uh, uh, from different walks of life, they made money through commercials. Uh, Karen Kay was on different series and Rennie Temple 
had been a folk singer and he inv got involved in series work. John Welsh, Susan Krebs, um, Mary Edith Burrell joined the group in California. So there were plenty of people who were really uh, up there. But, um, you know, I, I got lucky in terms of movies like Animal House and Crossing Delancey and the other stuff I've done. But they were all as skilled as I was. And the responses that we started getting, which were pretty good right away because we workshopped uh, and we did real improv. It wasn't like we would take suggestions and then fit them into a preset script. This was real live, right in front of your face uh, improvisation. One actor would, would introduce two other actors, would essentially get you know, an activity, a place and an identity. And then we would, we would start. And by within two or three years, our rate of success was extraordinary. And the laughter coming from the audience was like getting paid, going back to your original question. You can't make that, you cannot make an audience make that sound. And if you can make an audience make that sound, you, you may not get discovered, you may not, you may not get rich, you may, may not get on the Johnny Carson show, but I know I, I tried stand up once, but it, it, the only corollary is improv. But that's what kept me going because in my head, I, I said, that's not an accident because it was happening every week. And I had this company to work with for eight years, at least once a week. The group was big enough so we could work with four people or 10 people. And if you got a paying job, or a more paying job, like a movie or television or your Broadway or the theater, you could go off and do it. And uh, that's what I was able to do. And that's how I learned how to act. So I would say the first money was uh, Minnie's Boys, but the laughter in that improv company gave me tremendous courage because it was raw and real. Wow. And, uh, and, and the exciting thing was, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. But I learned so much because the goal was to make the audience laugh. And tell me how they found you, because you were a young guy still with Animal House. Tell me yeah. a little bit about, people would want to know yeah. about that whole thing about getting f found and being able to audition and what that whole process was. Well, I had... Uh, uh, I got an agent in 1975. So that's four years after I started acting. And I used to do what everybody else did. I'd take a picture and resume and I'd cold, you know, walk in cold into an, an agent's, theatrical agent's office. And somebody said to me after six months of my doing this, they said, why are you doing that? I said, well, isn't that how you get an agent? They said, they don't know you. They're going to throw, they're not, they're not going to look at that picture. You don't have any credits. I said, well, how am I going to get an agent? They said, you have to do a job where somebody's going to walk in and recognize your talent and recommend you to an agent. So I had gotten a job on Broadway at the old Billy Rose Diamond Horseshoe, which was on 46th Street. It was a, an old nightclub that seated about 300 people. And it was a play called Dance With Me that Joel Zwick directed. Oh. People may know Joel from uh, my, uh, my, my Greek wedding, favorite Greek wedding, whatever that movie was called. Anyway, um, and I, I got a call to come and join the show. Uh, and I, I don't even remember if I auditioned or not, but I got the job. And it was a Broadway, you know, a, what they used to call a middle house. And it was a musical. And fortunately, they didn't ask me to sing <laughs> because I'm not a singer. I mean, I could sing, but singing eight times a week is a different animal, as you, as you probably know. So after one of those performances, uh, a casting director named Howard Fuhr came to the show and I came, there weren't even dressing rooms. You know, we, we would take get dressed backstage. There was no room for any guests. And this guy, Howard Fuhr, introduced himself. And he said, 
who are you? And I said, uh, uh, Peter Rieger. He said, no, no, I know your name, but I'm a casting director and I've never heard of you. How did you end up with the lead in a play on Broadway? I said, well, well I knew the director and the writer, Greg Antonacci, and they asked me to do this. And uh, I guess I had been doing it for three or four months. And Howard said one of those things that's out of a, a movie about Hollywood. He said, what can I do for you? Wow. And I said, exactly that. I said, wow, I don't know. What can you do for me? He said, do you have an agent? And I said, no. And he said, uh, can I recommend a couple of people? Long story short, a guy named Johnny Planko, who was uh, an agent at William Morris, came to the play and uh, asked me to sign up with him. Wow. I was in the middle of choosing a smaller agency because back in my day, everybody was giving you bad advice, which was don't go to a big agency because you'll get lost. I remember that. And the truth is, you can go to a small agency and get lost, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I joined him in 1975, 1976. I did a play at the Cherry Lane Theater in Greenwich Village uh, by this new kid from Chicago named David Mamet. Okay. And the, play, the play was Sexual Perversity in Chicago. <laughs> I did it for eight months. And then I moved out west. Uh, my girlfriend at the time was this singer you may have heard of named Bette Midler. Uh -huh. so we went west. Uh, she went out there because she was looking for material and trying to get uh, movie work as well. And I went out in February and started, you know, William Morris obviously is out there as well. And I had an agent out there named Eddie Bondi, who was probably the, one of the most amazing people I ever met. Anyway, long story short, I was going up for things. I got a couple of episodes of MASH. I did a couple of plays, but doing the theater in Los Angeles is a very bizarre thing because everybody's waiting to get a series. So their concentration isn't exactly to be in the theater. But there were about three or four jobs where it was between me and somebody else. Now, nobody likes to lose a job, but in my crazy head, because of my folks, like I said, and this guy, obviously I was getting close. And then there was a call for college age students for this movie. And my agent sent me up and I'm sure there were thousands of people they were looking at. And I knew the material, I understood the character. The material, the script was fantastic. And I went in and I can't remember if I auditioned for Landis or for uh, Michael Chinich, who was the casting director, but it was around two or three uh, auditions and I got the job. Wow. And then we started shooting in in uh, Eugene, Oregon in October of 77 and came out in July of 78. So I, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, the movie was such a hit. Yeah. I'm sure it changed your life. Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's um, you know, no less a person than Burt Lancaster, who I did a movie with called Local Hero. He used to say to me, an actor needs an audience. And he understood the value of being in something that was nationally known, let alone internationally known, because it gives you, it gives your face a name and your name a face. And it makes it a little bit easier as you move along. At least your your manager or your editor, uh, manager or your agent can recommend you. And then it's up to the casting people to say yes or no, or you know, the director will meet him or he'll audition or whatever, you know, the process is. So So you know, when you when you did that uh, movie, you had a very raw John Belushi. I mean he yeah. He, he wasn't, you know, he was a young, inexperienced guy. Do you remember your scenes with him or if you had oh, yeah, anything sure. to do with him? Well, I, I knew John before he became John. I met him in 1973 or four in the village somewhere around 
West 4th and 12th. I, can't, I mean, it's stuck in my head, not because he was famous. I just, it's one of those things. I have a sticky memory for certain things. And a girlfriend of mine introduced me to him and probably he was with his wife, Judy. And he just was another schmuck on the street trying to get a job as an actor. And then I had seen him in Lemmings, which was probably 1974, which is a, a theater piece. And I mean, you know, he's obviously talented. And then SNL happened in 75. And, uh, you know, every all the scenes I had to do with John were so much fun. But I would say, you know, he was a brilliant sketch actor, but you know, a sketch and creating a character for an hour and a half, that's two different worlds. And he had great potential and that's what was so sad about him dying so young, but uh, he was great fun, but he also was a generous actor. The best actors I've ever worked with are not interested in being better than you. They want you to be trying to steal the scene from them. Because the stronger the actors you're working with, the better you will be. And he was always generous with all of us, as we were with him. You know, it was, it was a very sympathetic experience. And he was, um, you know, at the time, he was, he was working with us Monday to Wednesday. Then Thursday, he would fly back to New York to do Saturday Night Live. Then he would fly back on Sunday to work with us Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And this wow. went on for six weeks. Wow. And he was, you know, he was as professional as you could get. And, um, you know, that's how I know John. I know John from, and any actor will tell you that, even, even stand-up, so I know are a big part of your audience and your guests. You know, if you're traveling with a group of stand-up men and women, and you're all on the same tour, everybody remembers how crazy that particular club was, yeah. or how horrible that club was. You know, it's yeah. like a band of brothers and sisters kinds of thing, and that's what it was like with with John, and it was no different than anybody else. And again, my my, that's what was heartbreaking about it was he was, I think, because he died at 33. So he was, that's around the time, if you're lucky to get a leading part. That's when it starts to make sense. Because remember the early days of movies, there used to be something called the juvenile. There was the leading man and the juvenile. And the juvenile was of no interest. I mean, they were the, the you know, they were the young, kid, boy or girl, who was struggling. But the lead was Humphrey Bogart, right? Those, you know, Jimmy Cagney, Betty Davis. It was a totally different universe as opposed to today. So I, I want to ask you, is, did anybody else stand out from Animal House for you that you loved working with them, maybe stayed connected to them after the movie? I would say a lot of people I've stayed friends with. Uh, Karen Allen, uh, actually Karen uh, is the first interview I do in my podcast, which is called Peter Riegert's Vocal Heroes, which is a, a play on local heroes. But I, Karen and I have stayed friends, Tim Matheson, Bruce McGill, Mark Metcalf, uh, James Norton. Um, you know, it was, a, it was, Anybody who had that experience, whether you were in the crew or on the cast, nobody expects a success like that. And we had so much fun making it. It wasn't like it was drudgery. Now, very often people say, how much fun was it to make the movie? And I said, did you have fun when you saw the movie? And of course they would say, yes. I said, well, that's what our lives were like for seven weeks. Every day was like madness. It was hysterical. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing that about Animal House because again, it's 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 Americana. It's I love the idea of 
recording history, hearing those experiences from you about, you know, working Animal House, about working with John, you know, invaluable. People are going to remember this, for, you know, forever. A, a few minutes ago, you mentioned some pretty big stars from, you know, the uh, that were very, very big uh, before us. Right. Did you get a chance to work with any of those big stars as a younger talent? Did you get a chance yeah. to work with anybody? I, I would say the biggest probably was Burt Lancaster. Wow. Um, but I also worked with, uh, I did a movie called Chilly Scenes of Winter that uh, Joan Micklin Silver directed, who just passed away. She was pretty amazingly talented. Uh, produced by Amy Robinson, uh, Mark Metcalf, and uh, um, forgetting my, oh my God, it's really, it just went right out of my head. It'll come back to me. Anyway, I had a scene with, and that just went out of my head. It was John Hurd and me, and John Hurd's mom was played by, do you remember the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Oh, of course. The woman who was the loose woman? Yeah. That's who I'm trying to remember the name of. It's just a I'll never be able to help you with that. I know, I know. It'll come to me in the middle of a conversation. Anyway, I got to kiss her, or she kisses me in the movie. and. It, it was totally unscripted. It just happened. And uh, and Joan kept it in the movie. And she starred in a movie with Humphrey Bogart. And in my head, I'm going, I just kissed her. She kissed Humphrey Bogart. Does that mean that I've kissed Humphrey Bogart? I mean, you know, your brain goes cuckoo. And I work with Michael Caine, but I would say, I would say Lancaster was the last of the studio talents from that era in the 40s and 50s. You know, uh, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of scale. Uh, Lancaster was just so spectacular. I, I don't even know if he gets half the acclaim that he should get. I know if you talk to actors, they'll tell you Lancaster is, is right there with the best of them. I would say so. I, I think that uh, uh, as time goes by, you know, one of the phenomena of creativity is there are things often and people often that are successful in their time and lose not credibility but they lose their influence over time and then there are people who are not thought much of in their time and 20 years later you're suddenly going oh my god that, that woman was a genius or whatever it's like art. It's, it's why every year a new movie is discovered, a new book is discovered, a new painting is discovered. It's one of the beautiful things about making something that's going to last longer than you. You always want to, I'm not an idiot, I want to be around to, you know, celebrate something success. But um, I would say he had an amazing range. And he was one of the first producers actor producers he had his own acting company called Hectil Lancaster and he would he produced some of his early movies like the Crimson Pirate but he also produced movies like The Swimmer and Sweet Smell of Success and so he had a really bad he used to say because I asked him once I said how do you choose you've been a movie star since your first film and when I worked with him which was in 1982 he'd already done 83, four, five movies. He was 69 at the time when we did Local Hero. And he his expression was, I do one for the Pope and one for me. Mm. And the Pope was the one that paid the bills. And the other ones were, they weren't going to necessarily make him rich, but they were going to make him rich in experience. He's a very interesting, creative guy. It was a real thrill to work with him. You know, later on, to me, he made a field of dreams. And he's in what? One scene? Two yeah, scenes? Yeah, a couple of scenes. And maybe, maybe two scenes. He he just blew me away in that, in that uh, movie. Yeah. Well, I think that's an example of, uh, you know, when, when Lancaster did one week of work in Houston on Local Hero and two weeks in the Highlands of Scotland. And when he was finished, 
David Putnam, who was the producer, threw a party for a, a big party right off of uh, Loch Ness. Of course, where else you're going to have a party in Scotland? And Lancaster made a, an amazing speech to the cast who were much younger than he was and the crew. And he singled out the screenplay that Bill Forsyth had written and also had written for Lancaster. The odds of him getting Burt Lancaster were so remote. And he said, the hardest thing in the world is to find material. And this is some of the best writing I've ever, that's ever crossed my path. I mean, he didn't have to do that. You know, it was heartfelt. It was a great compliment to everybody who worked on the movie. And he, you know, it was, he, and he loved telling stories about Hollywood and all the people he knew and got in trouble with. It was, uh, it was one of those, um, you know, you can't pay for those lessons. They're, they're, they, you can't, that's where the luck comes in. And if you're a good listener, you'll hear amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Yeah, I love the idea of just recording Hollywood history. And uh, yeah. it, it's been fascinating to do this show. So lead me up to how you found and how Crossing the Lan and Lancy found you. Well, I had, I, I had done a play no, not a play. I had done a movie that Joan directed called Chilly Scenes of Winter, which was 1979. Griffin Dunn, he was the other producer with Amy Robinson and Mark Metcalf. And she, I, I tried to get in a movie she had done called Between the Lines. And she had come to see me, not me, but she had come to, well, maybe it was me, but I was in this play, this David Mamet play, who, like I said, hadn't become David Mamet yet. And I, it was me, F. Murray Abraham, Gina Rogag, Jane Anderson, who's now a big uh, screenwriter and director. She's done very well. And um, I didn't get the job to be in that movie. And I, you know, in my demented head, I'm thinking, you're watching me in this play. This audience is laughing as loudly as any audience I've ever been in. And you don't think I'm right for your movie? Now, I didn't say that to her. I just, I didn't understand the dynamic of it. You know, basically the director is choosing partly on instinct. So when Chilly Scenes of Winter came around, I couldn't get an audition. And my friend John Hurd, who I had done, uh, um, you know, we, we, we knew each other from the theater. John recommended me to Joan. And Joan said to John, you know, I've always thought of the character as taller. And John Hurd said, are you nuts? Nobody cares how tall the actor is in a movie. They can't tell the height of the actor. I mean, he'll look taller or not taller. Anyway, I auditioned and I got the job. So that's how I got Chilly Scenes of Winter. And then in 1987, I got a call from Joan saying, I have a script and I want to offer you the part of this character, Sam. And I think it was even before Amy Irving was hired. How was the script? Because so that's, that's the key. You don't know anything about the script. You don't know if it's going to be a great movie or not. Yeah, yeah. How was it for reading? Well, uh, I had read the play. The play was sent to me by the playwright, Susan Sandler, to do as a play. And I had a conflict, so I couldn't do it. And she wrote me a, a, you know, a sweet postcard or a letter, I can't remember which, basically saying, you know, I'm so sorry that, you know, we can't work together on this now, but maybe we'll do the movie. And of course, you know, everybody says that. So, well, not everybody says it, but it's not unheard of. And I thought, I just took it as a nice compliment. Because the odds of a play going to a movie are very remote. So uh, once I got the screenplay, it was clear. I mean, I, it, it just came off the page. It was one of the best screenplays I'd ever written or read. And you and saw it, yourself. Uh, say again? You saw yourself in that part. Oh, I got it. I understood it. it you know, I used to work... Before I was an actor, I did social work on the Lower East Side, and that's where the movie was shot. So I knew the neighborhood, I knew the people, 
I knew the stores. I knew Gus's Pickles where we shot. I mean, it was like, you know, old home week for me. So, but it was, uh, it was uh, all the parts were there. And tell me about the, the process of making that film because it really was a, a, a terrific film. I, I loved it. Well, you know, we, we shot it over, I, I think seven weeks, maybe eight weeks a little bit on the Upper West Side of uh, New York, Manhattan, and a lot of it on the Lower, uh, lower East Side, uh, which at one point was the largest uh, community or, or poverty-stricken community in the world because the immigrants used to, that's where they would go when they got off the boats from Ellis Island. A third of them would go to New York City and they were all poor. So there were remnants still that you could, you know, you could shoot that were, you know, the streets of New York. Lots of different, lots of different ethnic groups that made up the Lower East Side. And uh, Amy was a, a pretty young actress, uh, kind of. Amy was, um, uh, Amy was, let's see, she was, uh, she, her career was moving along and uh, she was perfect for the part. And, uh, um, you know, Warner Brothers released it. So, it all, you know, Jeroen Crabbe was in it and David Hyde Pierce was in it before he was famous from, from uh, his TV work and theater work. So it was loaded with talented people. And uh, again, we didn't know how successful it would be. I mean, it was a very different kind of love story and, uh, it, it, you know, it was an Animal House success, but it made at least five or six times its money in terms of, you know, what it cost to make. And, and how was it working with her? How was the chemistry between you and her? I th well, we had done Chilly Scenes of Winter, so we kind of had a, we had a, a, a simpatico for one another, you know. She was very happy with me in the part. Um, and and was very supportive. And you know, you don't really know until you edit the movie. But if you remember in the movie, a lot of what I do is, is listening. I'm not doing a lot of talking, but when I do, it's, it's really good. And they talk, the, the characters talk about me for 20 minutes before I show up. <laughs> so that's the greatest entrance you can have as a character because the audience wants to know who's it going to be. So summarize the movie a little bit for those uh, youngsters, younger people out there, get them interested and maybe go search it out. Well, it's, it's the story of a young uh, Jewish woman uh, played by Amy Irving, who works in a bookstore, who, who wants a life different from her grandmother, who still lives on the Lower East Side. And she looks at her grandmother as representing a generation that she doesn't want to be associated with. And I play a character who is literally a pickle salesman. I sell pickles out of barrels. And we shot it at a place that was called Gus's Pickles. And on the Lower East Side, there used to be in the, you know, in the early I went down there. Century, I saw it. Uh, there was a pickle stand, a pickle store on every corner, you know? So, um, so Amy, there's an expression from the Lower East Side that if you thought you were getting too big for your britches, people would say of you, oh, you're crossing Delancey? Oh, wow. Meaning, are you moving uptown? Wow. But the twist of the movie is that Amy becomes intrigued by me, so she's kind of recrossing Delancey. She's going back to the values of her grandmother. And that's where the poetry of the movie is. And Sylvia Miles uh, was in the movie. And uh, it was, a, a, you know, you have to, that's why casting is so important. The, the screenplay is premiere. And then it, 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 you really need, it's the talent that brings the script to life. So without a good script, you're basically, you're treading water. You know, you can make something mediocre less bad, 
but you can't make something better unless the material's there. And I've never asked this question before. Tell me about the day after the very last workday on that movie. So you've made this uh, movie. You, you never know if it's going to be a hit or not, but it, 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 it's in your system. You played this character and you played with these actors. So the day after that movie, how did you feel after that movie was done? Did it leave you any different? Well, I, I, every, every time you finish, finish a job, there's an element of bittersweetness to it because in a movie, you're, you know, once the movie's over, you're not going to see anybody unless they're already friends of yours or you've made friends until eight months later when the movie comes out. And then even in Animal House, I don't see people for months, sometimes years. But when we see each other, it's like we just saw each other two days ago. The theater is different because every day you're seeing the same people for four months, five months, six months, eight months. So I would say after the movie was made, I was thrilled that we that I got to be part of it. I didn't know what its reception was going to be. And that was eight months later. Um, and, uh, you know, I still stay in touch or, you know, she passed away, uh, uh, Joan Micklin Silver, but every once in a while I see Amy, uh, Griffin Dunn and I, our paths are always crossing. Um, um, although he was from Chili Scenes, but, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the fringe or it's one of the residual benefits of show business is that it's really intense over short periods of time. And you don't forget those people. Now, you want to hope that they're going to be people you like, but even the people you don't like or have acted poorly, you don't forget them either. So, uh, you know, it's a business that I left twice. I was in a personal appearance agent in the 80s. Uh, and I left and I loved the, the business so much, I went back and had different successes or a lack of them. But it's a great business. What was, I, I know, I have a feeling what your answer might be to this. And this will be the last thing I ask you. It's, you've been so terrific. I don't want to keep it too long. What, what was the most exciting thing that happened in your career that you could just say, wow, this was spectacular? You know, I feel like there's quite a few. Um, the theater is always special because especially if you're doing like the Mammoth play was very special because the sound the audience was making, but that play, Sexual Perversity in Chicago was filled with vulgarities, but poetically written, David Mammoth, it's an amazing writer, but the, it was new to this audience and the New York audience took to it in a way I mean, they would make sounds of laughter that were for an actor. I mean, you know, stand up, they talk about killing an audience. This was every performance. Wow. It was unbelievable. Wow. And there was one performance I did, or we did, and in the theater, um, you know, each night is different, but there was one particular night that the audience literally, there wasn't anything I could say or do or any other actor could say or do or move. It was, it was the most joyful sound you could hear. It was laughter that was essentially catharsis. And the next day, F. Murray Abraham and I were in the, uh, sharing a dressing room and a friend of his came by and uh, he, he came back to compliment us. And Mu I don't know if Murray would remember this, but I remember this. And I said, we, Murray and I, my memories, Murray and I both said together, oh, you should have been here yesterday. It was unbelievable. And this, he was an actor and he pushed us up against the wall. And he said, listen, you motherfuckers, I paid good money for these tickets and I'm here to give you a compliment. 
I don't fucking care how funny it was yesterday. <laughs> Snap out of it. And that was like an enormous lesson because every audience doesn't know what last night's audience heard. Right. The sound that my improv company made was, I mean, it was, I was really fortunate. I did um, a Harold Pinter play called, it was, uh, I had done four Pinter plays with a director named Carrie Perloff, who ran ACT in San Francisco for 25 years. And we did a Pinter play called Celebration. Same thing. We did it two nights after 9-11. Oh. We didn't even know if we were going to get an audience. Because if you remember, no, no planes. People were terrified. We didn't know if anybody was going to come out of their house. And we did a one act called the, the Room, which was Pinter's first play. And this play called Celebration, which was a comedy. And you know, when you're in rehearsal for four weeks, you don't know if the audience is gonna laugh because four weeks of working on anything funny, you lose your, you, why is this funny? And, and because it was so, such an intense experience for the audience that when the comedy showed up, I mean, the, the first play, was a play about terror and we we just survived 9 11 so it was really frightening wow and pinter could be really frightening well the comedy the play the second play started and they made a noise equal to what i described it was like they were breathing for the first time wow. so i had a lot of experiences like that and i would say one of the great joys of my life has been coming creating this podcast called Peter Riegert's Vocal Heroes. And I got to interview Karen Allen, Ruben Blades, Carrie Perloff, who I mentioned, um, Liz Holtzman, who was the youngest uh, woman elected to Congress in 1972. She was on the Judiciary Committee that got Nixon you know, impeached. I got to interview the brother and uh, niece of Mickey Schwerner, who was one of the civil rights workers who were killed in Mississippi in 1964. Uh, you know, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. That was powerful. I interviewed Matthew Goodman, who wrote a book called The City Game about the CCNY basketball team that won the NCAA and the NIT in the same year, 1950. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Amazing story. But it's really about corruption. The, the real city game is not basketball, it's corruption. And brilliant book, amazing writer. So I had a chance to put together a project in the midst of this insanity we've been living in for the last year. And I, you know, I can't hear the audience responding other than I can see that they're, you know, subscribing or they're listening in. And, um, you know, it's 50 years. There's a lot of years. I've, I've done 12 movies out of the country uh, from Japan to Argentina and uh, uh, Tunisia. I mean, places I never thought I'd go. And you've done some and, television. Uh, you've done television shows that I actually really love. Yeah, well, I, I uh, The Sopranos, I did uh, two seasons of uh, The Sopranos. Unbreakable? Actually, I just did. Uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, that was fantastic. Tina Fey hires amazing people. My good buddy, Carol Kane was on uh, with me. We were love interests, which was quite hysterical and great fun. And um, uh, yeah, I, uh, you, you mentioned The Sopranos, or I mentioned The Sopranos. They have a podcast also called Talking Sopranos. So I, on March 15th, I'm gonna be on their podcast Oh, wow. So it's all of these, you know, I'm basically doing what I've done for 50 years, which is I just got uh, work on the, the uh, HBO show Succession. I just finished my second episode there. I worked with James Cromwell. So I'm always surprised by a job when I get a job. Uh, I'm, I'm confident that I can do the job, but it's always very moving to me when somebody uh, either thinks to hire me or wants me to audition or offer me a part. And um, so I feel very fortunate. I did a show that failed, if it, you know, by definition, 
called Dads that I did with Martin Mull and a, 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 a really amazing cast. I'd never done four camera comedy before. So that was a new experience. That was 2013, 2014. Seth Green was in it. Uh, um, I'm sorry, my brain is freezing up here. But it was a uh, uh, an amazing experience, learning how to do that. And I was, I don't know, 66 when I did it. Uh, I mean, even Animal House, I looked very young. I was 30 when I did it. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. But I looked, looked, looked really young. So I would say, you know, have part, will travel. Mm. How can people find your podcast? Uh, wherever you get your podcast, uh, you can go to uh, Anchor FM. A lot of the podcasts are on there. Spotify, um, uh, Apple. You know, we're just look under Peter Riegert's Vocal Heroes, and you can find it. It's it's uh, been really interesting to do. Uh, we, this was the end of the first season. I'll take a couple of months. I've got to you know line up the next group of guests, and um, you know, occasionally I get to talk to people like you who who cover a different side of the world. I mean, I did one night of stand up, and. Uh, what was that like? <laughs> well, it was, um, I, I prepared for it with a friend of mine. And this was the gimmick. My girlfriend at the time was away traveling. She was on the road somewhere. So the hook for me for the standup, and I, I, Bud Friedman gave me, you know, 15 minutes on a particular night. And it was a big crowd. There were 300 people there. And I remember thinking before I went on, I mean, I was terrified and I'm not terrified as an actor, but I was, this was all new to me because I, you know, I've, I've stood with actors not knowing what I was going to say in an improv situation, but a stand up is a whole other world. So the hook was, I said to the audience, look, you, some of you may know me as an actor, but my girlfriend said, unless I get a job, she's going to pull Alyssa Strada on me. <laughs> And Liz Estrada was a Greek woman who organized all the women in some part of Greece, Sparta maybe, and said, if you guys continue going to war, no more sex. So that's what my hook was. I said, I have to show my girlfriend that I'm, I'm trying to get work. So my friend here, Brian Gordon, who's a director, he had his camera and I told the audience, He's going to photograph this because, and occasionally he has to show you. So if you feel the need to applaud and, you know, support me in my effort to get laid with my girlfriend when she gets home. And the audience was right there. And I did about 15, 20 minutes. It was thrilling. Wow. It was exhilarating. And what I did, I had like seven subjects. I knew how to get into the subject and I knew how to get out because I knew that from my improv work. So I, I was able to connect them and I could feel the audience. I could feel, well, this one isn't working, so let's get out of here. Just like all the stand-up guys do. And when it was over, I, you know, I said, that is awesome. Here's the problem. It's gonna take two years to put an act together. And I've already got an act called acting. <laughs> so, and the people that I admired uh, whether it was Lenny Bruce or Richard Pryor, you know, in my time back in the 70s, uh, I, I just knew how long it would take to put an act together. And I did. I really wanted to be an actor, not a, a stand-up. But for everybody I know who is in that world, you can't take off enough hats to in, in uh, recognition for how hard that work is. I mean, I would say, I would say, David Chappelle is one of the most brilliant stand-up minds I've seen in, in my lifetime, along with uh, Richard Pryor. And um, I never saw Lenny Bruce live, but my dad used to see him in Greenwich Village and he would bring his records home. And that's the first jokes I learned were Lenny Bruce, you know, when the one of the punchlines was, uh, 
this guy's talking to Dracula and he says to Dracula, make me a molten. And Dracula says, poof, you're a molten. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, the, the people who find their voice as stand-ups are so amazing. Chris Rock, I mean, Bet, you know, Bet was hysterically funny. I mean, she didn't do stand up, but if you saw her act, she was, you know, Whoopi Goldberg. Um, I don't know them all because I, I don't go to the clubs anymore like I used to. I mean, I, even Rob Schneider, remember when he was starting out, he used to do a routine with the 15 ways you can say the word dude. And it was hysterical. And, and I think, I, I really admire the men and women who give it a shot because it is really, really hard to find really tough. Really what tough. people say to me, people say to me, were you a comic? I said, no, 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 no. I could yeah. never do that. It's a, it was a, I, I, I could feel how much excitement it would have been to do. But it, if I were going to do it, that it would have been an instinct to do when I was younger. Like a lot of the, you know, the, these genius stand-ups, the ones who you would admire, and you know, it's, everybody's got a different taste. But I would say um, the ones who start, they they seem to have an inkling to do it when they're younger. I mean, I think Eddie Murphy was doing it when he was sixteen or so. 15, 14, 15. 15. Yeah. Did you know Bobby Slayton at all? He's from Westchester. Yeah, I didn't. I we, I think our paths crossed, but I didn't really know him that well. Um, but, um, you know, I just, I knew when I was doing it, when I got off the stage, I mean, I could feel the sense of power of what I had just done. Oh, yeah. But I just knew what I had just done was not an act. It was... I mean, to me, I think the great voices are the ones who, I mean, they've honed their act on the road, but it sounds like they're literally making shit up as they're standing in front of you. So, Peter, I want to thank you so much for being on the show with me today. This was my pleasure. fantastic. I'm so glad you accepted my invitation to come on the show. God bless. And I... Our time together was great. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. So long, Bruce.